As everyone knows by now, the Atlantic coast fishery is not in good shape. Plants have been closed and trawlers tied up as the fishing industry desperately tries to stay alive through these times of sluggish markets and high interest rates. The voices of industry and government are heard daily. But what about these men, the inshore fishermen, particularly the longliners, the gillnetters? They too have suffered. They too were feeling the pinch. Longliners are expensive vessels to build and to maintain. Fuel costs have skyrocketed. So has the cost of gear. In 1980, there was a strike. In 1981, there were no fish. And now, with uncertain markets and traditional sources of credit drying up, the fishermen on these vessels have a crisis of their own. I'd heard stories of impending disaster for a long time now, of fishermen facing bankruptcy, of boats for sale, of severe tax audits and third-party demands. I'd heard that this fishery, the gillnet fishery, is in real serious trouble. Bonavista was one of the first places in Newfoundland to have longliners. It's also one of the biggest inshore fishing communities on the island. And if you believe the story of John Cabot lowering the basket, the oldest. In early February, the snow was deep and the wind from the north bitter. Bonavista was shivering from the coldest winter people could remember. The town was quiet, sleepy. The inshore fishery seemed a long ways away. A bit of fun, a bit of foolishness at the vocational school to break the monotony of winter. The winter is long and hard. It will be a month, perhaps two, before the boats can be put in the water. It's here at the Marine Service Center that you begin to realize that the fishery is indeed the lifeline of Bonavista. There's a lot of money tied up in these vessels, and a lot of hope, too, for the fishery is all that places such as Bonavista can depend upon. The fishermen who will be sailing these vessels are awaiting the beginning of another season but it's a rather anxious wait. There's not much else to do in this area if you don't go fishing or in the plant. And I guess there's not much point in going in the plant if uh, the fishermen aren't bringing in any fish. So you're planning to sail now as soon as you can in the spring? Uh, whenever the, the season, uh, the weather permits here, you know, everybody's always a goal. There's a, a problem with some fellas lying on the first and getting nets for the upcoming season. And Why is that now? I mean, you've always got to get nets in the spring. Well, we could always go to, uh, to the core stories and you get the credit for the upcoming season. You get nits now when you pay from during the season. But, uh, right now, it seems like the, the core stories just can't get any nits and therefore we can't get any. And it's more just you got to go to the bank now for a loan and most of us are definitely nits now, we probably won't get a loan anyway. So, so the, you're not used to dealing with the banks? Well, it's, it's always been the loan board or, or the, the plant where we ship our fish where we get our, our credit. And, we go to a bank now with a 20% interest of 22. If we make any money in the summer, the bank is going to end up making the money. We're going to end up right back where we started. So what, what's the answer? I mean, well, you can't go fishing unless you get nets. That's right. Despite the uncertainties of financing their fishery this year, Melv Rogers and 19 other Longliner men are preparing as best they can. And that includes some schoolwork. They've enrolled in the fishing master's navigation class. Word has it that in a year or two, all longliner skippers will be required to have their Class 4 certificate. 
these fishermen from Bonavista and Catalina are determined to make it. It was a model class, according to the principal. This year, a number of fishermen were, um, were interested in uh, having this course offered locally. Uh, some of them had already applied to the college in St. John's, but um, they were suggesting, well, why have to go to St. John's if you've got space in your school and perhaps uh, an instructor can be found locally. So uh, I had a talk with the uh, director of extension service at the college, Mr. Ballamajor, and, uh, and from there we got started. And, uh, and so that's why this level four course, uh, which by the way, um, will be a requirement in the near future by the Ministry of Transport for those people who want to operate a longliner. Who are these men now taking the course? Are they longliner men? Um, the 20 men that are doing this course are uh, longliner fishermen. Um, some of them uh, barely had the sea time to qualify for doing the course, uh, but some of them have spent uh, perhaps 15 or 20 years in the fishery. But like I said, it's, it could become a requirement, so here they are. And they're doing quite well, I hear. Uh, well, you, you came down at a pretty good time. Uh, they're into exams uh, later on today, and uh, we did some exams last week, and so far of the exams they've done, all 20 have passed, so we're proud of that. They were all eligible for their unemployment insurance. They could have stayed home, collect the same amount of money they got here, but they're here because they see a need and, and uh, they've been really good to work with. Really enjoyed it. But it's not the classwork the fishermen are worried about. With low earnings last year and their regular source of credit gone, they're wondering how they'll raise enough money to begin fishing in the spring. Are you fellows going to have any trouble starting up in the fishery now this year? Or well, uh, getting gear? myself, I got to get credit somewhere. I haven't got the eight thousand dollars, seven, eight thousand dollars to go and buy it right out. Mm -hmm. So I got to get credit somewhere, either from the bank or from some of the firms in St. John's. Now, most fishermen aren't used to dealing with banks when it comes to the fishery, are they? That's right. I've never done it before, but I got to do it here. Do you think you'll have any trouble? Do you think it'll be easy to get money for the fishery? Well, I would say some some fishermen <coughs> might. Uh, Everybody's having fun easy. Somebody, some pe people are going to, uh, going to have difficulty getting uh, getting loans in eh? because uh, the way the fishery has been the last few years. Like last year <clears throat> was a poor year, and the year before that, of course, the strike. And uh, it hasn't been the last few years. It hasn't been hasn't been good. And uh, with inflation and everything, and the, the gear has gone ridiculous now. Everything is you know, and. Uh, when you're talking about the six or seven thousand dollars, four or five thousand dollars, I mean, it's going to be difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. well, so, I suppose it's a gamble for the banks because if anything happened to you, say you went out and put out your gear, just you got a sat, something come along and took it, or if your engine broke down and you couldn't get out to pay for it, you know, you got to take a gamble too. And the banks are not really in a, a place, I suppose, to loan you the money without you got something to put up for it. And right now you're not making that much money, you only trust it on employment, so, so you, can, uh, you know, it all depends. So you can see problems coming up now as you start the fishery this Seems year. Seems like it's getting worse right. all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're determined to go ahead with it, I mean the boats are there all ready to go. <laughs> well that's it, yeah. you got no choice, you got to go. Yeah. We're just hoping for that big year, <laughs> hoping it's going to get better and better. Every year we're hoping next year it's going to be better. Yeah. So it's a job to know, I suppose, why? because uh, Everything has gone so expensive. It's getting so expensive. There's a job to know what to do. Myself now, I got a 45 foot line on here, and I save anywhere from 30 to 35 thousand dollars expenses every year. And uh, it don't seem like the price of fish has gone up the hell of a lot in the last three or four years. And everything else is doubling. So it's getting nighter all around, I guess. But still, you're <coughs> you're gonna. Well, go with it. we got to go. <laughs> That's all we can do about it, I suppose. Like I said before, you, can, you spend 80 or 90 or 150,000 dollars like I've been after doing and then you, for a boat, and then you spend 25,000 dollars for gear, and you can just can't back out of something like that in a, overnight. You know, you, you probably wouldn't sell it now if you tried, so you're almost forced into it. And so the longliner men wonder, and so they worry. Where will they find the cash they need to start the fishery? Will they be able to launch these boats in the spring? This community and hundreds other like it depend on these men and these vessels. Some may not sail this year. For others, it will be a matter of hanging on, of hoping for better times.
it will be a question of survival. But Bonavista is only one community. What about the others? I decided to visit one other place on the northeast coast and soon found myself on the marine haulout on Twillingate Island. A lot of boats here too, some getting ready for the seal fishery. Others, like the Bonavista fellows, trying to arrange for their fishing gear and fuel. But it was the income tax audit that seemed to be uppermost in the minds of many fishermen here. Seventy-five percent of them found themselves owing money to the government last year when the tax audit was made. It caught them unawares. For many, it was, and still is, a crippling blow. Say in my case, half of my share that I would have from my own part, plus half of the boat part, so they take from you. But that leaves you then with very little money to keep your boat going, or do repairs, add on gear, job getting gear, because you got no money to buy gear. And in some cases, probably you didn't get your last year's gear paid for. You mean to say now that half your earnings are gone for uh, income tax? Yeah. Well, last year now, I tell you, one week there, my own part, I was supposed to take home a riot of gross of uh, something over $200 for my part, not including the boat. So when I received a check from the fish plant, I had $26. That was for what, for a week's fishing? That was for a week's fishing, yeah. And that's uh, Number one, the taxation took 50% of it, and then I'd be part of fuel to pay for. So I was, like I said, I left with $26, and I'd pay for no groceries for the boat for that week here. So if I'd have paid for groceries, I would have been down to, I don't know, probably 8 or $10. Dollars. And was that a week now when you fished for five days, or you made one? Or well, whatever we fished for that week, could be three days, could be four, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, number one, the fish was scarce, and it wasn't that much fish, so. But you did punch in your time. We punched there. in our time, yeah. Whatever time we had to punch in at it. And I'm only one, but I'm just, I know a good many of us that happened to. As far as to own this and that. What do you and the fishermen think about the tax audit now? Do you think it was fair? Do you think... Uh... No, it's not fair by no means. I know now everybody should pay income tax. I'm aware of that. But then on the other hand, they should give you half a chance. Where they took... Uh, 50% of my part and 50% of the boat, I think the boat part was wrong. I don't think they should have touched that at all because it takes all the boat makes to keep her going. Fuel is high and your maintenance is high. And every year you got to do I put this one in the shade there a while ago now and I don't know exact figures what the cost was right now outside $3,000. And she said, and I don't know why I haven't moved yet. A few years ago, I mean, if you wanted to draw a fuel or Ten drums, I suppose, you went to the fish plant and got your fuel, and if you got a few seals, you went back and paid for it. And you got no seals, well, it just went on until the summer, and as you started fishing, then that they got their money. And right now, I don't think the fish plant has owed a dime on fuel that they've let out for sale, you know. And I don't know if they owe very much now on, even on for whatever they let it out for. But still, that you can't go up there now, and like we did then, they send a truck down there and fill up your boats and go on. Right now, they you can't get a gallon up right well. So because they, they're hurting, you're hurting well, too. Well, I guess, yeah, right. I mean, they're tightened up, and that means that we got to tighten up too. Well, now, some people here have trouble getting fishing gear this year because... because yeah, we had a little bit of trouble, but we I think we got it straightened out now. But coming next week, I think, our gear is. I see. So it was a bit of a job to get it, wasn't it? A bit it? of a job, yeah. I suppose we waited some many people after it, and the companies, I suppose, can't carry it all, you know. Yeah. And I suppose that's what it is. I don't know what else is. Yeah. But how many how many nets do you need now to operate? Well we got 120 nets, but you want about 40 or 50 webs every year. Right. Yeah. 50 or 60. So you're looking at a fair cost each spring, aren't you? Well you want to around four thousand dollars, see, every winter now. And last year now, see, the government told us up, we income tax, certainly that's on the go all the time. Sorry. And uh, took our bit of money. But we had for our boat and everything, you know. So you weren't left with enough money we to get We weren't left with nothing. I mean, you come in, we, out there last year, we come in with 50 or $60 for the week when the fish was scarce. And when you go up the plant and get your bit of money, you'd have $30 for to bring home to your family. Must have been pretty discouraging. Well, it's just, we're used to small lots of fish and one another years ago, but now, I mean, you got so much expense. I mean, before, you only had a rope on or something. You, 
You could go and get a bit of grub, I mean, but now, I mean, everything is different, you know. I mean, you've got that seven or eighty dollars every week, I mean, for to pay your bills or a hundred dollars. That's nothing then. So you were really crippled last year because well, of the Well, most of the fishermen around was crippled the air. I mean, there was a scatter puller what got a few herring and one thing and another, you know, on the cape. And, well, they, they had a chance to, you know, to survive, but there's a few boats, uh, I mean, the most, a lot of the boats, I mean, never had the privilege of getting no cap on one thing another when the water was dirty, you government come then took the bit in income tax. I know you had to pay it, but if you only had fifty dollars, I mean, for your boat and you owed something up to go, go you said, wherever you owed it to, I mean you go up there with fifty dollars or you didn't have nothing to pay for nothing, anybody. No, and so you were in a pretty poor we, position when when the spring came around this most year. Most of the boats was like that, sir, yes. When now the year now, I mean we got this was a young brook. Broke. It's not a good way to start off. Even if you arrange the financing of the gear and the winter maintenance costs, there's still fuel and provisions. And on top of all this, there are new regulations on quality control, which means the holes of these boats must be renovated at a cost of several thousand dollars. It leaves a lot of fishermen wondering where all the money is coming from. But how common are these problems? Are other places suffering? What's the general picture? I figured if anyone would know, it would be Howie Hamilton of Fisheries Management Services in Gander. Over the past few years, he's helped thousands of fishermen do their books and make out their income tax. Well, Howie, just how bad a situation is it now for the gillnet fishermen on the northeast coast? Well, to give you an example, Dave, to date our firm has completed 72 income tax returns for fishermen, and that's very small at this time for February. Out of those, the average income is approximately $6,386. Now, you have, you have to consider that is not uh, any great amount of money when you, when you consider that from that amount he has to deduct a salary to himself, get a return on his investment, and further and further pay off his debts from last year. Now, out of, out of the uh, 72, 47 of them never even made any money from a cash point of view, not from a tax, even from a cash point of view. So overall, I would tell you quite honestly, this industry is in very serious trouble. Uh, this year, the tax department predicts they will do approximately 1,200 more tax audits. We have fishermen that are, have been audited for the past four years, oh, approximately anywhere from 6,000 to 20,000. And you have to also consider that a new federal budget came down, which really hits fishermen because they are small business. How, does, how does that affect fishermen? Well, I might point out in that area, there's two particular provisions that would have an effect on them. Any fisherman, for example, who purchases a boat after November 12, 1981, instead of normally being allowed to write off 15% of that boat per year, they will be limited in the first year to only 7.5%. So therefore, there will be more tax to pay. So there are more blows coming up against the fishermen this oh, year? Oh, yes, no question about it. Secondly, our own minister, Mr. Ramke, the Minister of National Revenue, has decided in his wisdom to tax fishermen at source, just like they were employees. So now what, you, what you've got is a situation where a fisherman has to get 50% of his gross taken for back taxes, then he has to get income tax taken off that gross for the current year, then he has to pay his crew, then he has to pay for his supplies. And quite honestly, like last year when we did quite a few of them, some fishermen after a week's work netted $12. And there's no end in sight in that particular situation. They're in a very serious financial position. And to give you an example of that, our firm just started a brokerage for selling boats. As of now, at this taping, we have something like 42 boats for sale. That's in less than one month. Now, out of those, 82% of them are selling their boats for one reason. They cannot survive. They're too far behind in their debts. And now that's, that's it. That's just very, very true there. So a lot of fishermen are, are going to go under this year. Well, a lot of fishermen have already gone over, gone under. The trouble is they don't know it. Technically, half of this industry is bankrupt. You just consider for a moment. You have all the fish plants in this province knocking on the government's doors for money. They want loan guarantees. Fishermen can't go that route. 
So, you know, they just have to suffer quietly. But uh, so they a, are there's, a, there's another hidden crisis in, in the fishery, that, really, the inshore fishermen. Oh, yes. What did, I remember back in 1967, Joey Smalley wanted a resettlement plan, okay? The, the resettlement plan is going to come about in the next few years regardless. Simple reason, most of these inshore fishermen are not going to be able to stay in the business. So therefore, they're going to have to leave their homes to get jobs, to go to bigger cities to get jobs. There's no question about that. I cannot see, even with Mr. Kirby, and you have to give Mr. Kirby due respect, he's taken on an enormous job. I cannot see how he is going to solve the problems of the fishing industry in six months. That's a pretty grim picture you paint. Well, that's reality. I mean, I deal with two or three thousand fishermen a year, and not too many fishermen make money, contrary to popular belief. Very few to make any amount of money, for as example, a civil servant sitting at a desk eight hours a day with absolutely no responsibility. This type of individual makes twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year. Not too many fishermen in this industry, which can be checked with Revenue Canada statistics, make twenty and thirty thousand dollars a year. Well, Howie, this is a pretty discouraging picture you paint for, for the fishery. Uh, is there anything at all that can be done about it? Yes, there are solutions to it, but they're involved the fishermen's union, the federal government, the provincial government, and the processors, and the fishermen. So, you know, I cannot speak for all of them. However, for the fishermen themselves, I would say that some immediate solutions can be obtained. Number one, for example, the fisher's loan board should extend their credit to gear, which is the fisherman's major expense after his boat and regular equipment. Number two, the banks have to open up their vaults to fishermen. This can be done without any big problem through the Small Business Development Bond, which, was now, which now covers fishermen. So, you know, there's no reason why fishermen cannot benefit from that under the Income Tax Act now. Does this mean that he has to mortgage his house and his car? No, this is a special bond, okay, that uh, is not too complicated in the way it works. But basically, it gives fishermen money, okay, and everything is, goes through, di through the way of dividends. Why do I suggest in that case, if a fisherman is interested in, in financing in that manner, contact the local branch of his bank. And they have all the details on that. Number three... Again, you know, if the, if the provincial and federal government can give loan guarantees to fish plants in the area of two and three million dollars, why not give them to fishermen who you know are going to pay them back over a reasonable period of time? So therefore, I suggest that some form of government guarantee should be given to banks for fishermen on their gear or on their other debts that they owe. Number four, I found with Fish Show 81, okay, that if you start putting your business in a variety of places, you'll get a better price. So what I'm suggesting is fishermen should start tendering for equipment they need. For example, you take the fishermen in Port of Grave. If they, they all use pretty well the same gear, crab pots. So let's say they want to buy crab pots. Instead of one guy going and buying them, why not 20 individuals go and buy them as one group? Chances are they'll get a better price. So force a little competition. Force competition. We have no competition here in Newfoundland when it comes to this stuff. That's what's killing us. We have one company that controls the whole economy for gear. And they can charge whatever the hell they want. There's nothing you can do about it. And if you shopped around, you'd find what I'm saying is very true. And uh, the, only, the only other thing I can see, if a fisherman can't make it by having a boat that he owns, why not lease a boat? Nothing stop a fisherman from leasing a boat. Then he just pays for the lease payment, and that's the end of it. Now, you know, what I'm saying is, is very simplistic. But, however, it's very real, too. These things can be done immediately. And so, prospects are not good for the gillnet fishermen. It will be another year of hanging on and hoping for better times. Many will undoubtedly give up. But it's not an easy thing to do, after a lifetime of fishing, to suddenly quit and look for something else. And then, what else can you do in places like Bonavista and Twillingate? Such places must depend on the sea. They always have, and they always will. The men who will soon sail on these vessels are the cream of the crop, keen, aggressive, They've had the guts to respond to the challenge when our government a few years back said to build and to invest in the fishery. They did. They built the big boats, the longliners, 
and now they're hanging like albatrosses from their necks. Many fishermen are broke, many are in the hole. They're confused, they're worried. But they hope that in the plans to reorganize, to restructure this industry, they won't be left out in the cold. Three or four years ago, it seemed like fishing was the thing of the future, and now all of a sudden it's gone downgrade to nothing. See, so, five years' time, it might be up again. There's a job to know. You've got to try to plug on as long as you can, you know. Until the time comes, that you just got time on the wire to leave them. Jesus is there to say, what's going to happen? But that's all ever we've done, and there's nothing else for us to do now when we get up this age. Yeah. Not that old now, but I mean. You've been at it all your life. You've been at it all our life now, and there's no way you're going to go away now. I mean, I suppose you would if you had to. Business is business, okay? It's not a charity. Now, fishermen are not looking for charity, but they are looking for a fair shake. 